In the Royal Naval Air Service, Canadian air crew served in all of the fighter squadrons at Dunkirk, their large continental base. They went into action against German zeppelins, seaplanes, and U-boats from bases on the east and south coasts of England, such as Felixstowe and Portland. And they helped to pioneer long-range strategic bombing. They flew a range of aircraft, such as Sopwith one-and-a-half strutters, camels, and pups, Short Brothers seaplanes, and flying boats, such as this Curtis H-12 Large America. Of half a million tons of British shipping which sailed in the last two weeks of April, 400,000 tons were sunk by either mines or submarines, mostly within 200 miles of the coast. This was a level of loss which simply could not be sustained. To counter these attacks, seaplanes, flying boats, aeroplanes of the RNAS, and non-rigid airships flew almost 4,000 patrols between the summer and December 1917. During seven and a half thousand hours of flying time, 86 German submarines were spotted and attacks pressed home on 58 of them. It's estimated that more than 200 Canadian airmen were involved in these operations. Only one submarine, so far as I know, was sunk by the Royal Naval Air Service aircraft or RAF aircraft during the First World War and it was sunk by a, uh, a flying boat flown by two Canadians in the channel. The really important thing was to keep submarines from surfacing in the vicinity of shipping. And they succeeded in this beyond all imagination. With air escort and convoys, they reduced the sinking rate to practically nothing. In the history of air power, there is perhaps nothing as controversial as strategic bombing. In the First World War, long-range bombing on targets of great strategic importance were thought to be things that would have a very strong impact on the outcome of operations in the war. It was almost inevitable that the high command of the Air Force would push strategic bombing. It was the RNAS that pioneered long-range bombing on the Imperial side. The Royal Navy, after all, viewed the strategic potential of this new weapon almost automatically, being well used to operational deployments all over the world. But this wouldn't last for long. The disbanding of the RNAS came as a result of uh, political differences, um, inter-service rivalries, different philosophies about the way in which aircraft should be used and aircraft should be procured. And um, eventually it was, you could say, a victory of the war office over the Admiralty. By no means everyone agreed, either on the new force or the new role. One of the strongest opponents to strategic bombing was Field Marshal Douglas Haig, the commander of the British armies in France. In my opinion, our military policy in aerial respects must be based on the principle that a successful end of the war could be brought about only by decisive victory over the enemy's forces in the field. I have no reason to suppose that the bombing of German towns merely for the purpose of terrorizing the civil population is a method of warfare which would be approved by His Majesty's government, nor would I recommend its adoption and General Hugh Trenchard, Haig's commander of the Royal Flying Corps, thought that the push for the creation of a unified air force was part and parcel of the bigger push for a bombing campaign against Germany herself. This had been prompted by a public demand for reprisals in response to German raids, one of which over London had killed 66 schoolchildren on the 13th of June in 1917. Trenchard also maintained that the whole argument was based on the notion that the war could be won in the air as opposed to on the ground. The mainly Canadian three wing of the RNAS, based at Luxeuil in northern France, was the first assigned to bombing operations deep into Germany. And Canadians served in significant numbers during the RAF's bombing offensives of 1918, maintaining and flying aircraft such as the Handley Page 0400 and the de Havilland DH-9. 
The strategic bombing campaign was launched from a number of bases around the town of Nancy. It lasted for more than a year, during which time more than 500 raids were carried out. Typical of the bombing crew's experience is that of 104 Squadron's dawn raid on the 22nd of August. 13 DH-9s took off to bomb the BASF chemical works at Mannheim. Crossing the German lines, one aircraft was immediately shot down by anti-aircraft fire. Eight enemy scouts appeared and stood off, waiting to pounce on stragglers. In a little under four hours, the squadron lost seven out of 12 machines. It was a scene repeated throughout the year. Total losses to the independent bombing force amounted to 458 aircraft. A British commission went to Germany shortly after the armistice on an inspection tour. After all the thousands of bombs and incendiaries that were dropped, they had expected to discover scenes of devastation. It is very noteworthy how surprisingly little serious damage has been done throughout four years of war, and on no occasion has a factory been forced to close down for more than a week as a direct result of bombing. It did not affect the output of the factories in any way. Canadian flyers began to appear in significant numbers toward the end of 1915. By 1917-18, when the war in the air reached its peak, the numbers and skills of Canadian air and ground crews were important elements in the RFC's successes. This is the Zeppelin Raider L-48. It fell to the guns of Torontonian Lieutenant Loudon Watkins of 3-7 Squadron on the 17th of June, 1917. It was her very first bombing raid over England. And this is L-70, the first of an enormous new type of Zeppelin. The huge airship was destroyed by Major Egbert Cadbury and Captain Robert Leckie on the night of the 5th of August, 1918. Of the 12 Zeppelins shot down by British aircraft in the course of the war, six were accounted for by Canadians, either individually or as part of a team. Aerial fighting was a special skill in which several Canadians won widely acknowledged distinction. Men such as Bishop, Collishaw, Barker and McLaren became household heroes in Canada and Britain. In fact, Billy Bishop from Owen Sound, Ontario, became the leading British ace of the war, being credited with 72 kills. And of course, he won Canada's first Victoria Cross in the air, which was also notable because it was awarded on the strength of his word alone, there being no witnesses to his dawn raid on the enemy airfield at Estormel. Major Ray Collishaw of Nanaimo, B.C., led the famous Black Flight of Naval 10, the RNAS squadron, in his Sopwith triplane. He was credited with 60 victories. Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was credited with 80 victories of his own. The Fokker triplanes of his so-called Flying Circus, Jagdgeschwader Ein, were distinguished by their exuberant paint schemes and marking. Richthofen was flying a solid red plane when he was shot down and killed on the 21st of April, 1918. Captain Roy Brown of Carlton Place near Ottawa was credited with this action. The third Air VC was won by 2nd Lieutenant A. A. McLeod of Stonewall, Manitoba. In March 1918, the Germans mounted a furious offensive that smashed through the Allied front. McLeod was aloft at the controls of his two-seater reconnaissance aircraft when he and his observer were jumped by eight Fokker triplanes. Soon, his aircraft was on fire. It seems fantastic, but when the heat from the flames became too intense, McLeod climbed out on the wing and piloted the plane from there. Despite being wounded five times, he made a successful forced landing in no man's land. He was hit for the sixth time as he carried his even more badly wounded observer to safety. Aerial fighting was by no means confined to the Western Front. 
Led by Major Billy Barker, VC, 14 Canadian fighter pilots based beside the Piave River in Italy together accounted for some 130 enemy aircraft destroyed. He won his VC in October of 1918, when, though wounded three times, he shot down four German aircraft before crash landing his Sopwith snipe behind the British lines near Valenciennes. At its best, air operations in the First World War welded infantry, artillery, tanks, and aircraft into a close-knit combat team. Most aircraft were used in the very uh, pedestrian kind of flying of reconnaissance, artillery spotting, and cooperation with ground troops. And by 1918, uh, there were two very important roles for aircraft in the ground war. One was supporting ground troops in the trenches by actually low flying and strafing enemy formations. And the second thing was what they call counter anti-tank operations. You had aircraft destroying enemy anti-tank guns, which enabled our tanks to advance. Early in the last year of the war, Canada finally accepted Britain's invitation to organize a wing of their own within the RAF. It was intended to form one Canadian fighter squadron and one of bombers. What was wanted in Canada was the development of aviation for domestic purposes, and a Canadian Air Force was tied to the formation of a Canadian Air Board, and what they did form was a Canadian Air Force in Canada that replaced the Canadian Air Force overseas, uh, using the gift of aircraft from the Royal, Royal Air Force, large numbers of aircraft from the Royal Air Force, and some of the aircraft from the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service, the HS-12 flying boats that the United States Navy gave to, to Canada after the war. And these resulted in the creation of an air force that was uh, designed to support both civil and military purposes.